Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much. It is now 1 p.m. in Paris. Hello, everyone. I am Raoul Mille. I am the scientific advisor to France's permanent representation here in Rome and member of the organizing committee for this third International Science Day. And I'll just say a few words while we're waiting for everyone to connect. You will find the name of all the organizing committee members at the end of this session. I am delighted to meet you just one year after our last Science Day. And we will be opening it in a moment uh, with Madame Céline Jorgensen, our ambassador. Many people have uh, signed up from the five continents, following us uh, from New York City, having their coffee, from having lunch in Dakar, or perhaps having an evening tea in Sydney. I'd also like to Say hello to the village in Guyane and our forestry friends and our researchers from around the world. This is not necessarily a traditional scientific conference. We have serious uh, topics, but we also hope to make you smile. You will be able to attend in French or in English, and all of the presentations will be available for download after the event. If we cannot answer all of your questions today, as last year, we will try to answer them in written form if you send us an email. Leonid Chizik, one of the greatest living jazz pianists, always says before his concerts, listen carefully because what you are hearing is unique and you will never hear it again. He also told his students that he wasn't teaching them to play piano, but he was teaching them freedom. Freedom is essential in jazz, in arts, and also in science. And International Science Day is also an invitation to celebrate academic freedom in a world where we sometimes take it for granted. In this uh, 2023 International Science Day, we would also like to express our thanks to three people who are no longer with us and who would have loved to attend. Saint-Exupéry, whose book Le Petit Prince is 80 years old today, And Lise Rambenet is showing us an illustration here. She will help us to think about our topics because a picture is sometimes worth a thousand words. Also, James Wright Forster, who is known as the father of the system of system dynamics, and who in 1972 wrote Limits to Growth. He worked for the study of systemic thought. And finally, Adrien Douadi, one of the greatest French mathematicians of the 20th century, century well known for his contributions to system, dynamic systems theory, numbers theory, and also for his famous rabbit. He loved music, and he would have loved to transform our agenda into notes or formulas. The 2023 edition will focus in particular on farmers who have the earth in their hands. And here you see a book dedicated to them, as well as a science book called Horizons. This was uh, contributed to us by an anonymous donor whom I'd like to thank. And finally, you have the latest Asterix album, Lyris Blanc. These excellent books will be 
offered to the authors of the three best questions that will have been asked during the session. So please put your name on your questions. And to conclude, remember last year Rabelais was our, uh, our sponsor. And this year, it is his friend Jean de La Fontaine, who is a pillar of French language around the world, and he will be our symbolic sponsor this year. The fable, The Miller, His Son and the Donkey, was written in 1868. And it says that no person could imagine to please all of the people all of the time. We will try to please all of you today, however, and all of our speakers will do their best to satisfy you. And now I give the floor to our ambassador, Madame Céline Jorgensen. Thank you very much, Raoul. Hello, everyone, colleagues from around the world and dear friends. I'm very happy to welcome you virtually as ambassador, permanent representative of France to the United Nations in Rome, to this third edition of the International Science Festival, presented on a three-part theme, agriculture, food, environment. The United Nations in Rome is three organizations, the FAO, the World Food Program, and the IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development. We initiated this annual meeting uh, two years ago on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the Science Festival, which was created in 1991 by French Minister of Research Hubert Curien. And your enthusiastic feedback has convinced us of the usefulness of these meetings, particularly here in Rome. I would especially like to thank the presidents and experts from the French research institutes, CIRAD, INHI-A, and IRD, as well as other speakers from the CNES, the FAO, the Food Systems Coordination Center, and the Holy See. This third edition remains. I'd like to thank also the artist, the uh, pianist, Timothy Mill, and the illustrator, Lison Bernet, and of course, Raoul Mill, scientific advisor to our representation here. This third edition remains faithful to the spirit of the Science Festival. You have heard that we're focusing or we're under the sponsorship of the great French poet Jean de La Fontaine. The spirit of the festival is that of freedom, curiosity, and intellectual openness, allowing us to approach with a perspective that we do not always have the luxury of taking, the scientific foundations of issues addressed in the United Nations agencies here in Rome. In this regard, the 2023 edition inspires me with some general thoughts. In 2021 and 22, we discussed school nutrition, agroecology, digital agriculture, the Great Green Wall, and the fascinating world of the microbiome. Transversal debates also focused on scientific diplomacy, support for public policies, and collective scientific expertise, as well as ethics. This edition is placed under the theme of the 2030 Agenda, the United Nations Common Compass for Sustainable Development. We know that many factors are likely to compromise the achievement of this agenda. This is why the Secretary General of the United Nations organized a dedicated summit in New York on September 18th and 19th to accelerate the implementation of this agenda. Each country is responsible for the national measures it takes in this regard and will be accountable to its citizens, both present and future. The solutions adopted by each are diverse diverse, of course, adopted to each national context, as they say in UN language. But science is common and speaks with a single voice. 
It provides political decision makers with fundamental data to inform their choices, and it constitutes, ultimately, the barometer and the, the and the judge of peace of commitments. Saying this, I realize that if science is unique, scientific approaches can be multiple. Hence, the interesting play on singular and plural, which appears in the wording of this edition, and which, I have no doubt, will enliven your discussions, which I wish joyful and fruitful, as in the spirit of this International Science Day. Thank you very much, and I wish you excellent debates. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. And now we would like to invite Valérie Verdier, who is the President, a Chair and CEO of IRD, to take the floor. Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank on behalf of IRD, CIRAD, and IRD, and INRE, and the organizers, in particular Raoul, all the speakers and participants from around the world. As uh, the chair and CEO of IRD, I am especially honored that our institution would be present here for this third International Science Day, as the ambassador has just reminded us, which is focused on the 2023 agenda. This is especially important as we are halfway through the time allotted for this agenda. We can see that sustainable development or the SDGs, this was made, there was a meeting last September for the midway point, and we've seen that deep transformative changes are necessary in order that we should take a clear path towards sustainability. Science is a tool for transformation, and we must uh, use all of our means to achieve positive results. The International Science Day is an opportunity to look beyond 2030, to look towards the fundamental necessity of maintaining a tool for the convergence of states to achieve sustainability around the world. And this is the role of the 2030 Agenda since it was first launched. So we are working with colleagues uh, such as those who are present here to build together with partners in the Global South and overseas to find concrete solutions to today's problems. Science plays a role in policy making, and all of the countries in the UN signed the resolution of September 2015 called Transforming the World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And this resolution calls for a scientific work through regular debates around technology, science, and innovation, and also the creation of mechanisms to facilitate the implementation of science. And so, for IRD, this is a duty. We have contributed to this in a very special way, in a particular in the panel that put forth the first report on the sustainable development in 2019. And what we have confirmed is that we must have a holistic approach to the major challenges today, food, climate, health, biodiversity, inequality, security of people, and peace. Those who drew up the report suggested one method, that is to identify points of entry and leverage points in the system. One of the systems that we identified is the sustainable food system. The relevance of this approach was confirmed four years later in the World Report on Sustainable Development in September 2023, and we will have a presentation about that in a moment. And I'd like to take advantage of this to say hello to Ibrahima Ati, who took on a significant challenge, which is he has a 
40-page report, and he has agreed to sum it up in just a few minutes. So thank you very much for that. We now have different ways of uh, undertaking research around the world. And the 2023 report tells us that we need to develop inclusive science so that we can improve and accelerate the scientific response to the achievement of sustainable development goals. This report really encourages me in thinking that we must keep our approach based on sustainability science. We must go farther, in particular, in our discussions with policymakers. There are concrete transformations to be made. We have created a fair and equitable scientific partnership with interdisciplinary topics using working with citizens who are committed to the achievement of the SDGs. At the IRD, we will be making a pre presentation on the general approach to sustainability and the main methods to be used by focusing on opportunities and challenges for the world of the academy in order to find solutions for sustainable development. And finally, I would like to say that today's world really requires that we change our ways of living, our ways of working, if we want to achieve the targets that we have set for 2030. This means everyone must be involved. Citizens, people working in art, communication, the private sector. And when we're looking at something that is as complex as sustainable development, we need to work in more and more innovative manners. We need to work on the 17 objectives of the SDGs. We need to document controversies. We need to have better integrated public policies. The principles that are applied to academic study, of course, must also be taken into account. This means better collaboration, better taking account of uh, native knowledge, knowledge from indigenous peoples. And finally, the scientific community also contributes to other multilateral instances uh, like uh, COP28 and to health issues while we are looking for efficient responses to complex problems. And these solutions can only be found if we work hand in hand all together around the world with the scientific community. I'd like to thank you very much, and I wish you all an excellent International Science Day. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Valérie. Thank you, Céline. Now, we will be moving into the first session, Sciences and the Agenda 2030. Excuse us for a few technical issues with the English interpretation. We have done our best to correct this. And we thank you for your patience. Ségolène Allée des Fontaines, over to you for this first session, Sciences and Agenda 2030. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Madam Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, chairs, CEOs, participants, welcome to International Science Day 2023. The Agenda 2030 is a universal agenda that engages countries from around the world, as it has been already said. The international community has set this, uh, this horizon of 2030. But we're already focused on what will happen after this as well. And there are many other agreements like the Paris uh, Climate Agreement that help us to define our path towards the future. Science and sciences 
can help us to achieve or to accelerate implementation of our objectives with regard to the SDGs, despite the fact that it is very urgent and that there are many obstacles in our way. Science and sciences, in the plural form, can help us define the what and the how of things. We can have a common language. We can facilitate mutual understanding. And sciences can help us to listen to one another. We can see what the situation is today. We can see what scenarios are possible for the future. We can share information and measure progress or lack of progress. And all at different scales, depending on the objectives that we are trying to reach. And in terms of policy and in order to accelerate transformation, science can help us by creating more impactful solutions. We're thinking about the living lab or innovative solutions. So we have some eminent participants in the food system who have undertaken analyses regarded regarding the 2030 agenda, in particular, Ibrahim Atier from the EPAR, looking at agricultural and rural perspectives, then we can have keys to understanding to what science or sciences can bring to sustainability studies with Olivier Dongle from the IRD Research Center. And finally, we will hear from Sylvia Ekra from the UN Food Systems Coordination Hub. And she will be sharing with us her point of view on the role of science in the transformation of food systems. These systems that look at agricultural f systems, forest systems, soil systems, And in our 2019 and 2023 reports, we have seen what are the shared objectives we have for the Agenda 2023. Food security, environmental security, and more generally, the health of our planet. So first, we will hear from Dr. Ibrahim Atier. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ségolène. I'd also like to thank Raoul for this opportunity. The report mandated in 2016 on, development, on uh, sustainable development for the 2023 agenda makes a connection between science and public policy. It is an instrument based on relevant data it is drawn up every four years. In the process of drawing up the report, there are contributions made from scientists around the world. There are regional consultations. In particular, uh, we have peer contributions. So the conclusions of the recent report, look at where we are and where we're going and how we might get there. We've seen that there's a stagnation in the face of multiple crises with regard to biodiversity and any loss and inequalities. And we can see that there will be a setback on the SDGs if no action is taken. Now, where are we headed? Uh, basically, we found that a lot of high-level statements and partnerships uh, were increasing, but we also find that there are a lot of weak links, mainly when it comes to funding 
and a decline in international cooperation. Now, what do these different scenarii teach us? In a high ambition uh, scenario, we see that most of uh, the uh, objectives will be close to achievement by 2030 and will have been achieved by 2050. But if we remain where we are or if we go towards a further gradual uh, progress, uh, many goals will not even be achieved by 2050. So you can see that we need very deep and widespread changes in order to achieve these SDGs. Now, what do we need in order to shape the future? Uh, you'll see in the next slide that in order to accelerate uh, uh, progress, you need to use the links between the SDGs by leveraging synergies and by also managing the compromises and the arbitrages that arbitrations that need to be made between uh, SDGs. So this requires contextual analysis in order to define priorities. And we also have to uh, uh, favor more collaboration between science and policies and we also need to institu institutionalize uh, SDGs. The 2023 report also recommends working on six entry points for transformation. So these were entry points that were already suggested in the 2019 report. And the 2023 report also uh, goes over some interconnections that can help us make very quick progress. This 2023 report also added uh, an enabler that of uh, capacity building. On the next slide, you'll see that the analysis framework that we suggest that we recommend in the report talks about leading the transformation through, its, uh, through the different phases in an S uh, graph. And so basically this means that while working on uh, sustainable systems and innovation, we also have to wake, uh, work on dominant non-sustainable systems. And then when it comes to emergence destabilization, um, well, while we work on emergence, acceleration and stabilization, we also at the same time have to work on destabilization, breakdown and phase out. And this will also help uh, to identify um, solutions that are specific to each sector and on the next slide you'll see that the transformations are all linked with each other the different systems are linked to each other and this means that we need consistent actions to generate strategies and also to manage uh, the conditions. Now, the analysis framework also suggests going through these various phases. Can we just have the previous slide, please? Sure. So, the strategies for the achievement of SDGs are the ones that you see on the screen and we need to actually combine all of them in order to work towards uh, SDGs. So there was a call to action at the end of this report uh, addressed mainly at governments to establish an SDG transformation framework for accelerated action and we also ask uh, member states to uh, establish national plans giving priorities to SDGs and to also tackle bottlenecks. There is also the idea of establishing a roadmap for businesses and local communities and also to integrate funding of SDGs in uh, various budgets. But all of this, of course, needs a uh, capacity building when it comes to training, pros, uh, foresight, public commitments, uh, etc. Another call to action involves 
taking transformation through the various phases that I outlined earlier and managing the links between the various transformation processes. We also need to improve. One minute for concluding, Ibrahima. Yes, we have to continue to work with science and invest in uh, research and in evaluation. In conclusion, we think that a better future is possible, but we must not rely on one single source of uh, security. We need to look at climate, energy, uh, geopolitical, all aspects, and we have to use resources as judiciously as possible. And we believe that the 2030 Agenda is still relevant and that we need to work towards it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Atier. I was so impressed in the way in which you so clearly and concisely presented this very substantial report. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to give the floor to the next speaker, Dr. Uh, Olivier Dangle, who's going to make a presentation on signs of sustainability. Olivier Dangle, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Next slide, please. The next one again, please. I'm going to start with a presentation on the definition of a science of a sustainability. This was a definition that was published by UNESCO in 2015 uh, when uh, the 2030 Agenda was published. So basically we're talking about a series of activities of teaching and of research that generate knowledge and new technology that generates innovation and a comprehensive uh, comprehension uh, that enables societies to better rise up to uh, the challenges. So we are really talking about problem-based um, solutions. Uh, so to better rise up to the challenges of sustainability at the international and local levels. And in the 20 years uh, uh, behind us, if we have looked, uh, if we look at uh, the major challenges that were faced, uh, the main ones involve. Uh, the understanding of science of social ecosystems, uh, understanding of uh, interdisciplinarity, and uh, as we recalled in the first few presentations, uh, there is the issue also of talking about transformation and talking about science that goes beyond the university uh, world. So there are four uh, pillars to the science of sustainability and I'd like to talk about how science can uh, help in achieving uh, the uh, 2030 agenda. So basically we're talking about uh, um, social ecosystems the going from uh, the planet level to the local community level. And then we're talking about the science and SDGs. We're talking about uh, science and technological and social innovation and the science and uh, transformative solutions. So basically, um, when it comes to social ecosystems, uh, we're talking about concepts and methods that can uh, bring together the global and the local levels while taking into account uh, the 12 main uh, essential points that are necessary for uh, life. And what's important in this uh, donut here that you see on the graph is that uh, on the one hand you have uh, planetary limits and then on the other you have the socio-economic uh, uh, challenges and you realize that both uh, developed economies and developing economies face the same problems and this donut can also be applied at the local level for the past six years, um, the city of Amsterdam has been using this uh, same graph to develop uh, local policies based on these reflections. Now, the second uh, pillar involves uh, science and uh, SDGs. I'd like to give you two examples of science and sustainability. So we have a map of uh, 
Africa here. Basically, this map shows regions in which uh, there's a huge prevalence of insecticide spread mosquito nets. And in the same map, you also have uh, the regions where there is a high level of fishing or rather overfishing. And so basically, this uh, represents, this shows that uh, these are regions where people, local populations are using mosquito nets to fish, uh, to go fishing. And um, the idea here behind science and SDGs is to really tackle all aspects of a particular SDG in order to arrive at a holistic comprehension of the issues at stake. And then thirdly, I'll talk about science and technological innovation. We really need to find this code of collaboration that was a, a term and expression coined by the Harvard Business Review. Very often we talk about collaboration uh, that is based on a specific uh, context and problem-based science, but science also needs to be pluralistic. You have a minute to uh, conclude, says the moderator, and then science needs to be goal-oriented and interactive uh, as well. And then lastly, the last pillar is science for uh, solutions and for transformations. And here, the focus in is on how you're doing things, and this involves participation, adaptability, and basically you're adopting the posture of uh, reflection and of reaction. My last slide is to tell you that we need to rethink the university world, the academic world, in favor of uh, the 2030 agenda. And I've uh, put up here two prefaces that were very important that came up in the, that were published in uh, famous uh, reviews such as Nature. And we really need to also rethink the way in which we do research because research must be useful for society. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Olivier Dangle, for this very complete overview uh, that looks uh, at how the academic world must reintegrate uh, uh, into uh, the active works for um, uh, for the uh, achievement of SDGs. Now I give the floor to Sylvia Ekra, who's going to talk about her uh, point of view uh, on transformation of food systems. Uh, uh, which is one of the central systems uh, that need to be transformed for uh, the achievement of SDGs. Uh, Thank you very much, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you for this International Science Day. I'd like to react to Ibrahima and Olivier's presentation. We've worked. I've worked a lot with Ibrahima. I'd like to and my greetings to him. So the 2030 agenda, I think that speakers before me have already spoken quite a bit about this, so I won't dwell on it too long. But let's look at the midway point. There are some SDGs that are, or some ODDs that are well on the way to being achieved for 2050. But certainly the entire agenda will not be realized because we are behind schedule on quite a few things. I'd like to focus a bit on food systems at the heart of the SDGs. Sometimes we think about uh, SDG 2 when we think about food systems, but in fact, the non-sustainable systems that we have now are connected to all of the SDGs. If you look at SDG 1, we can see that 
two thirds of people living in extreme poverty worldwide are agricultural workers. So this is connected to SDG one, but also ODG, SDG five on uh, equality between men and women, also SDG 10 on inequality. So there are uh, poverty actually uh, among agricultural workers has a lot of impact on the different SDGs. With regard to the target of zero hunger, the number of people who are faced with hunger in the world has been increasing since 2015. and the number of people who cannot afford healthy, healthy food continues to rise. Then we have the question of fresh water withdrawals. Agricultural uses 70% of all fresh water withdrawals around the world. SDG 12 on sustainable consumption has to do with the food that is wasted and a third of the food produced around the world is wasted globally and then for SDG 13 we know that food systems continue to contribute to more than one third of greenhouse gas emissions. So Ibrahima mentioned some of these things but it's important that we continue to think about all of the 2030 agenda and not just SDG 2 when we think about food systems. So Ibrahima mentioned this as well as Madame Verdrier. We can see that the transformation of food systems has been recognized as one of the six key transitions that must be achieved in order to have the scale and the speed of transformation necessary to reach our goals for 2030. So, 20, 23, that is today, we knew we now have confirmation of what the entry points and levers are for these transformations. And I think the link between science, which was already a lever, and scientific research has been clearly established. We need to increase international visibility of food systems. Many of you were present at the Rome meeting that focused on this. And clearly, we cannot achieve the 2030 agenda without transforming our food systems. Thank you, Raoul. I will hurry. This is why we have created this uh, cluster of initiatives focused on science organizing dialogues with the national coordinators who are in those who are most invested in moving towards a sustainable food systems there are 33 scientists from around the world who work here under Jean-François Stennis these dialogues have enabled us to focus on the role of science in the transformation And when we look at the role of science, as we saw last July, it's important to fuel our debate with this systemic scientific approach. We're finding new solutions, better data gathering, and new partnerships. We've heard a lot in particular from Olivier Dongle about the science of sustainability and this systemic approach is necessary for the achievement of the 2030 agenda. And I think the understanding of all the interactions and the synergies will come with deeper analysis, an analysis that is shared intelligently with policymakers and national coordinators with regard to new solutions. Yes, innovative solutions do exist. I think we'll discuss that later, but they need to, we need to better integrate traditional knowledge 
we have to work on subnational levels and we have to create uh, partnerships with uh, diplomacy and with uh, the world of policymaking. And as Ibrahima said, this, these partnerships are not getting stronger in many cases. We need to be closer to our national coordinators and at the uh, initiatives cluster. We are glad that we are able to focus more on cooperation among scientists from different sectors and institutions throughout the world so that the international coordinators can adopt this systemic approach. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sylvia Ekra. We have many questions now. And the moderator has told me we could have we could take two questions. The first question, perhaps for Ibrahim Atier, with regard to the degradation of ecosystems, including agricultural ecosystems, does the impact on human health of the non-respect of SDGs? Has that been evaluated, the impact on human health of the non-respect of the SDGs? Or that's for Ibrahima or Sylvia or Olivier, if you would like to answer as well. Thank you. We have taken an approach looked at the state of advancement of the SDGs and how we could work to transform systems as we move towards the future. So we were mostly think, thinking about a methodology of transformation rather than human health impact. Thank you. And there's a second question. I know it might be difficult to answer this briefly. Madame Sylvia Ekra, would you say that uh, the world of academia is on the right path for uh, accompanying this necessary transformation? And how can the university help uh, policymakers uh, define their priorities for the transformation? I think it is a very important question. There's a lot to do with um, making decisions well upstream, whether it's policymakers or researchers. Uh, there's one type of work that has to do with um, making results more legible to policymakers and citizens. That's that's part of the work that we have to do, so that people can immediately understand what our field work shows, what we can demonstrate. So we have to put scientific data. First of all, we have to collect this data, and then we have to translate it or present it in a way that people can easily understand it. And still, there's a lot more data collection that needs to be carried out, in particular with regard to interaction, with regard to what we call the spillover effect, that is, the impact of effects that are generated in one country, but that have an impact on another country. Thank you very much, Sylvia Ekra, and I'd like to thank you all. And now we'll move on into the next session. Yes. Perhaps after the last session, we will be able to take a few more questions, although it's true that we do have a rather tight schedule. Hello, Raoul, and thank you. Hello, Madam Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, um, 
the CEOs, the presidents, and all of the researchers and participants. We're going to look at the question of international partnerships now, which is really at the heart of SDGs. And this is for a very simple reason. That is because no single uh, agent can solve the huge challenge and the complex challenge represented by the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda. But these partnerships are quite varied and different depending on the types of agents that are involved, the objectives, uh, the themes, and also the, who are the initiators of these partnerships and how engaged the partners are. And of course, the uh, any pol political decisions made at a regional or international level regarding the partnership. So some of these partnerships are especially ambitious and have a large reach and provide a concrete contribution to science for the resolution of certain SDGs. And that they do play, these initiatives play the role of interface indeed between science practices and what people live and public policy. So now we will hear from four such initiatives covering different fields, soil and soil health, zoonotic diseases, food systems and agroecology, space observatory for climate, and we'll be hearing about these different initiatives, starting with Paul Liu for the Soils and Soil Health Initiative. Salim is not a ghost, I'd like to reassure you. He just forgot to turn his camera on. Oh, I'm sorry, says Salim. It's true, I had put on my camera blocker and I forgot to take it off. Paul Lou, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Initiative 4P1000. I would like to talk about our vision regarding the importance of soils and soil health. When we look at the World Partnership on Soils, we can see that many SDGs must take account of the soil health. And on this slide, you can see that a number of SDGs are cited. And when we presented our partnership, we could see that seven of these SDGs are particularly concerned and almost all other SDGs are indirectly concerned by soil health. So, beyond what was said earlier, we could say that soils are really at the base of the food system and at the base of life on the Earth, uh, healthy human life, uh, good food systems. And this in a both direct and indirect manner. The objectives of the 4 per 1,000 initiative with about 8,000 participants around the world, NGOs, research institutions, uh, businesses, NGOs, and farmers associations, our objective is to increase carbon sequestration in soils via organic matter to improve food security, to adapt agriculture to climate change, and to contribute to mitigating climate change while contributing to the SDGs. And when we look at it more closely, we can see that there are three main SDGs, which we see here in the center, and then indirectly two others, which are important to consider when we're looking at soil health. So why are healthy carbon-rich soils so important? Well, when we can remove greenhouse gas emissions from the earth, that mitigates climate change. We can increase water retention and reduce susceptibility to erosion. And finally, 
This contributes to food security and can restore degraded soils. From a scientific point of view, we can see that we can, if we don't use the best adapted techniques, we won't be able to improve the quality of the soil, as we can see in this slide. There are a certain number of techniques and practices that are used that we are that we can use well today. And we can actually intervene effectively in this field with the technologies already at hand. So if we reuse mineral fertilizers and phytosanitary products, we can see that traditional agriculture will have to yield to natural forest ecosystems if we are to achieve our 2030 agenda. We need to push forward with this transformation using the different techniques that were mentioned in the previous slides. Beyond the SDGs, we also have a sister agreements that were signed in Rio concerning soils and soil health. We've in particular talked about the problems of desertification. We've talked about soils affected by climate change. And we have understood that agriculture through food systems has an important impact on soil health. And finally, we have the agreement on biodiversity that has shown us that agriculture or conventional agriculture or indirectly through deforestation has been responsible for the massive erosion of global biodiversity. So we are beginning to understand a little bit more about the importance of soil health, but we need to push it forward even further. So important things to remember are that we must work on healthy soils because soils rich in carbon sequester carbon. They're rich in organic matter, full of life and biodiversity, and they can support biodiversity and ecosystems above ground. They're rich in organic matter. They can absorb large amounts of water for use by plants and they're less make the land less susceptible to erosion from wind and water. And finally, healthy soils are more fertile soils, allowing long-term agricultural production with stabilized yields. So healthy soils are an indispensable point of departure on a national, international, and regional level. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Liu. I was just looking at the book that uh, you're showing, and I'd like to uh, thank everyone who's asked questions in the chat. We will try to be answering them at the end. And of course, as I said earlier, one of you will be seeing this book as a prize. Thank you, Raoul, and thank you, Mr. Liu, for this very interesting presentation. I'm now going to hand over the floor Without further ado, to Mano Lunas, who's going to talk about uh, the international initiative called Preserve uh, to prevent zoonosis. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, this introduction, Selim. I am delighted to present to you the Preserve uh, initiative and talk about an example of uh, cooperation when it comes to preventing zoonosis. This is an international initiative driven by science with a simple but ambitious vision, i.e. to build a world where the risk of new zoonotic pandemics is reduced and where the practices for land management are sustainable while preserving food security healthy food regimes and uh, livelihoods thanks to the coordination of research programs and sharing of knowledge. 
And this vision can only be achieved uh, with the One Health uh, approach, which seeks to uh, come out of the silos and to build links between human and animal health, uh, ecosystemic health, and planetary health. And this, of course, uh, speaks to the reduction of uh, poverty, reduction of the uh, preservation of biodiversity, and uh, many other objectives. So we're going to talk about uh, strengthening uh, both local and uh, global uh, systems. And we're going to involve policymakers, local communities, doctors, researchers, scientists, so as to bring them all together in order to co-construct solutions. The next slide. This ambition requires a robust uh, partnership that covers all countries, all sectors. And for this reason, we organized 27 participative workshops that brought together many actors coming from 120 different countries. And these workshops also covered many uh, different uh, disciplines and strands. So the idea was to go from the local level to the national and the international level in order to uh, leverage all know-how and uh, knowledge. And we thus were able to develop the first roadmap that uh, came up with ideas as to how to prevent the uh, future pandemics. So we have, um, at this stage, more than 230 member institutions coming from uh, 25 odd countries. And uh, between now and 2030, we're going to build upon a common framework in order to implement and coordinate our research projects, to coordinate also our surveillance systems and operational projects in order to maximize their impact. And we're going to also build a platform in order to enable uh, data and knowledge sharing. And we're going to also build a resource center that will help in uh, decision making. Now, in my next slide, you'll see some of the concrete actions of uh, this initiative uh, that are built on six different uh, pillars. We have um, working groups, research programs, and we're also going to revise the strategic agenda, and we're also going to uh, publish scientific uh, documents and papers. The initiative also seeks to participate in international events. And we have undertaken a process of labeling of research programs that are in line with the pre-zodes uh, objectives. This is with the idea of building a larger community of research. And we also have an international secretariat. And this secretariat is going to support all of the uh, concrete actions of this initiative. And our governance system is also now established. We have an international steering committee and a general assembly, as well as a committee of donors. And we also have the One Health platform that comes in on uh, the matter of governance. And then finally, we have a platform of data that will be available to the entire community. In my next slide, you'll see the perspective in which uh, Prezod, the initiative Prezod, links together with the uh, SDGs. So we aim to contribute in a comprehensive manner to the SDGs. So Obviously, we're looking at uh, SDG 3 on health, SDG 17, that is uh, the uh, subject of this particular session, i.e. partnerships. But we're also going to look at socio-ecosystem, such as uh, such um, as defined by Olivier earlier. And in this way, we're going to talk about the conservation of aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. 
and we're also going to contribute to the development of sustainable agriculture. And for all of this to be possible, we need to promote realistic actions and actions that can be applied in human societies. And so we're looking at a systemic uh, implication. And in conclusion, I'd say that the One Health approach, which is at the heart of the Prezo initiative, is necessary, is absolutely essential for a profound transformation of society. And uh, international partnership, but also local, uh, also partnerships that take local initiatives to the international uh, front, is a key element, are both key elements in order to uh, efficiently prevent the emergence of zoonosis. And we also have to build on science to co-construct concrete actions for prevention at the local, regional and uh, national, international levels. Thank you for your attention and uh, feel free to contact me if you have any further questions. Thank you, Manon. And now I'm going to hand over the floor to Olivier Oliveros, who's going to talk to us about the Agroecology Coalition. Thank you, Selim. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, event. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think you've all understood uh, about how essential food systems are um, for uh, uh, our survival and to also reduce the effects of climate change. Food systems are paradoxically actually responsible for a third of greenhouse gas production and are also responsible for biodiversity losses, pollution and uh, and are also responsible for the depletion of natural resources. And we need, therefore, a transformational change. Various uh, international political documents mention agroecology as a major lever uh, to achieve this transformation. However, we are confronted with many obstacles, and this is why agroecology has adopted a different paradigm. It's a social movement while involving science as well. We need to work with uh, multiple actors at the local level, and we need to take into account local uh, contexts and uh, cultural values. This will favor co-learning between local actors and researchers. And in practice, agroecology is considered as a new practice in order to develop an agriculture that is more respectful of environment. And this involves taking into account indigenous knowledge when it comes to resource conservation, the taking into account of biodiversity and uh, techniques to improve soil fertility as a social movement. Agroecology has come up as a response to some of the major crises and a key to changing food systems. And this, in fact, has become the political framework for many social movements that have enabled many populations to affirm their rights. Therefore, agroecology promotes the right to uh, feed ourselves and we do this on the basis of uh, 13 principles which seek to improve um, the resources and to promote social respect. Our mission is to accelerate the transformation of food systems through agroecology guided by these 13 principles. 
Now, a coalition, as of uh, November 2013, has brought together 47 countries and we're guided, our works are guided by a steering committee and uh, five different working groups that are mentioned here on screen. Our action is also built on three pillars, facilitating co-creation and exchange of knowledge and experience, to promoting need for increased investments in agroecology, and thirdly, seeking political engagement and increased commitment to agroecological transformation. Here you have a small overview on the kinds of activities that we work on, on our various pillars that I've just outlined. We really intend to show that agroecology works. And now when it comes to funding, we're looking at the various tools through which we can measure the efficiency of agroecology. And lastly, we've also conducted and participated in a large number of conferences to raise awareness on agroecology. And now here you have an idea of the different kinds of activities uh, that are led by the coalition. We have been involved in mobilizing resources, sharing best practices, or even capacity building activities. In conclusion, I would say that agroecology is a whole system um, approach, and agroecology can lead to multiple solutions. We need to ensure that all of our challenges are dealt with not in isolated ways, but rather need to be considered as a whole, as a coherent object. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Oliver, for this very comprehensive presentation. I'm now going to hand over the floor to our last speaker for this session, Mr. Frédéric Bretard. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here with you. I hope you can hear me. I'm not going to turn on my camera. Mr. Bretar is actually attending a conference and has very kindly taken the time to uh, speak with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, just, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, space um, uh, for climate observatory. Well, the objective of this uh, particular observatory is to develop operational tools uh, uh, to enable uh, local territories adaptation to climate change. Well, it's an international uh, initiative. I simply wanted to show you in this picture that satellites are everywhere and with the help of satellites we can observe many, many things. Uh, things to do with the development, climate change, uh, and you can see here that uh, there are so many things um, uh, to do with geolocalization, agricultural issues, uh, natural resources, etc., uh, etc. Et so, so many things that you can observe uh, through satellites, forests too, and in fact, I'm going to talk about them later. And so satellites basically are used on a daily basis. And uh, on the next slide, you'll see that uh, this alliance or initiative was created. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. So this uh, alliance was created in 2018 uh, during the One Planet Summit, the first edition of the One Planet Summit. And it is completely in line with the 2030 Agenda and is in line with the implementation of the SDGs. The idea of uh, this entire initiative, oh, there are so many things that are coming up on my screen at the same time, sorry, says the speaker. Well, the idea behind all of this was to respond in an operational way to the SDGs. Of course, satellites when used to observe uh, the planet Earth uh, 
can in fact contribute to all 17 of the SDGs uh, uh, to build knowledge, to build tools, uh, to pursue these goals and uh, move forward in this very long pathway. And you can see here that we work in close collaboration with UNOSA, um, and they've conducted a very interesting study on uh, case studies, use cases. Um, and I urge you to look at this document uh, that is extremely relevant. Uh, and in fact, uh, the SEO was mentioned in this report. In the next slide, you'll see that this international alliance now has a charter signed by 45 entities. Uh, uh, there's INRA, IRD, uh, CIRAT, all of them are signatories of this uh, charter. And the international objectives of uh, SEO is to uh, come up with operational tools, uh, to also come up with uh, observational data for planet Earth, uh, so as to favor cooperation and create a network between the various space agencies, because these space agencies are very uh, technical. And the idea is also to bring into this network private entities who can also bring to the table a certain number of services and solutions for users such as uh, cities, municipalities, uh, local communities, or public, other kinds of uh, public institutions that are in charge of landscaping and urban planning. So there are a lot of international initiatives, uh, including large agencies such as uh, ESA that have very, very ambitious programs. But we have smaller entities too that are signatories of uh, our charter um, that look towards us for um, usable data and exploitable data. Today, SEO is an uh, international initiative, yes, but it's also uh, a portfolio of different activities that involve monitoring various habitats, monitoring the loss of biodiversity in various regions, response to extreme natural uh, events, uh, monitoring uh, of uh, deforestation in the tropical belt, but also in coastal regions. And we also have many projects when it comes to water management, fresh water management. So when I say management, I'm talking about water management as a resource, but also management of uh, natural disasters linked to water. So we have uh, 45 members, not 42 as shown on the screen. Uh, and these projects are being conducted in France, but across the world as well, thanks to our various partnerships and thanks to our various partner scientists who are based in uh, all of these countries that are highlighted here, Madagascar, uh, South Africa, uh, Latin America, etc., etc. Next slide, please. You have one minute to conclude, says the moderator. Uh, well, then... Uh, I'm just going to give you an example of um, a very specific kind of territory, uh, southern uh, uh, land here, which uh, uh, actually was managed with the help of data that uh, the SEO uh, was able to provide. Provide. We were able to chart and actually map out uh, the biodiversity in a very precise way and also chart the evolution of biodiversity in the light of climate change. I'm just going to move to my uh, last slide to conclude. <laughs> so my conclusion is to say that we're very active when it comes to communication. We uh, speak a lot about our projects and about our teams. We have a a specific uh, website that is uh, very well uh, uh, informed and uh, 
if there is one message that I want to leave you with, well, it is this. Uh, uh, the observation satellites are very accurate and they give us very trustworthy data that are both uh, comprehensive and accurate. And this data can be used to understand the past, uh, to document the present, and to also uh, uh, predict the future. And they can help us come up with solutions and tools to adapt to climate change. And thanks to initiatives such as the SEO, we can see that uh, the space field is fully contributing to the achievement of uh, uh, the uh, SDGs and the 2030 agenda. Thank you, Mr. Bretto. And now we have quite a few questions in the chat. One question that comes up quite a bit has to do with ways of working together, in particular with non-university actors, because there can be the these, these initiatives seek transformation. But how do you think you could work with people outside of the realm of research, but in, in civil society, political agents as well. With regard to Présod, we work on two scales with other partners. First of all, with regard to our governance, we have uh, whole section of our headquarters that is uh, dedicated to working with civil society and in the implementation of our research projects and our research program. We also include members of civil society so that we can implement our research work in the field. Yes, as I was explaining earlier in my presentation, our initiative is a partnership with many different partners, NGOs, civil societies, governments, international organizations, and all of these different members can have a role to play in determining uh, proposals made by the initiative. Yes, we have a, we also try to include in our steering committee, we have representatives from uh, native peoples, from uh, farming communities, from civil societies, NGOs. So we have tried to make our activities more visible to people outside of uh, the academy. And our activities uh, should be seen as being very important to people in their everyday life. Yes, and I would add that for the SCO, we are mostly a partnership. And to be a partner in the SCO, there must be end users who help to build the tool with us. This is one of the um, one of the very reasons at the heart of our approach. Some other questions have to do with moving from theory to practice. In particular, Aminatou, how do you go from things that are written to things that are put into practice when you're talking about zoonotic diseases and then you're talking about agroecology. How do you put things into practice? Go ahead, Oliver. As I was saying earlier, we are very sensitive to the fact that we need to understand all of the different agricultural 
technologies concerning crop and livestock management, all sorts of activities, all approaches should be guided by environmental principles as uh, Manon described in her presentation. So Manon, before you answer, there's a question similar to this. So how do you scale up when we're looking at the food value chain? How can you ensure that these practices are inscribed throughout the value chain? A lot of things are still research, are still conceptual. How can you get them into the real world and our value chains there? Agroecology aims at closing production cycles, no? both at, on farms and uh, both on farms and the regional level. So it enables the agricultural sector to reduce and recycle both farm and food waste, for example, through methanization and composting, as well as urban and industrial waste by recovering organic matter. So that's one. Another way is to integrate agroecology and value chain analysis. Our colleagues at the CGIR through their agroecology initiatives, for instance, have developed rapid agroecological uh, value chain analysis, uh, a guideline that incorporates agroecological principles on the farm, business, and institutional levels. Third, we need to encourage and support development of local and regional markets, processing hubs, and transportation infrastructures to increase employment and business opportunities and promote essentially that circular economies. Yes, I'd just like to add that it's important that the farmers themselves participate because it is farmers who are working in the fields and they, they work with the soil and we work with the farmers on our soil labs and also it's important to keep businesses involved, in particular businesses that are in the supply chain, people who are placing orders. They have a very important role to play. We have to promote these new practices, practices that are beneficial to the health of the soil and to the future of agriculture. Yes. When we're talking about prevention of animal diseases, it's true that it's important to act very far upstream. And the idea is that research should be able to offer innovative solutions for prevention. And these uh, solutions should be based on agroecological values. So that we can have more resilient systems. So, agriculture, livestock production. All of this needs to be taken into account when we're considering how to best prevent zoonotic diseases. What do you think about the risk of diseases associated with? global warming, in particular um, insect migration, and Alors, when we're looking at agricultural production. Well, there is a risk associated with vectors and invasive species. There are diseased vectors that can also have an impact on agricultural production. And this is why the holistic approach is so important. En agissant donc sur sur le réchauffement climatique, encore une fois, on va réussir à. And it is true that by limiting global warming, 
we can limit the uh, proliferation of emergent health issues related to the uh, increase of disease vectors in particular that have an effect on animals that are raised for human consumption. We have uh, one more minute, so perhaps a last question concerning the biodiversity of soils in your initiative. Yes. It's true that biodiversity of the soil is very much uh, related to the health of the soils. What are we looking at the macro, micro, or mesoorganisms in the soil? Uh, biodiversity makes the soil more healthy. It's extremely important. And finally, a really hot button topic today, perhaps for Mr. Bretard. How do you mobilize artificial intelligence tools? How do you use them in your research work? Our projects come, was created through a call for tenders. There was one for France, there was one for the international scope. And indeed, we will be using, uh, scientific teams will be looking at partnerships looking at partners who can, in fact, use these new AI tools. But that's not the only thing we're looking at. There are many different algorithms that can be used beyond AI. So what, what we want to focus on is things that work. We want to be able to extract information from our big databases so that we can have relevant information with regard to the issues that we've identified. Thank you very much. And indeed, we have a, quite a mix of data here. And now, let's leave a little room for art, which is another kind of data. We'll have a, a minute uh, or a minute and a half of music and drawings for you to admire. So let's have a little rest for our brain cells. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll hear a little music again at the end of our International Science Day. And uh, we'll hear from Jean-Luc Schott for the third session, I'm afraid. 
we weren't actually able to see the drawings by Lison Bernet, but I hope we'll be able to see them at the end of the next session. So Jean-Luc Schott from IRD. Thank you, Raoul. I hope everyone can hear me well. Hello, Madam Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, CEOs, and hello to the whole community of International Science Day. The previous presentations showed how much since the 21st of September 2015, when the UN resolution was passed with regard to the Sustainable Development Goals, we have seen that this has been a great, great lever to propulse research forward through partnerships and has helped us to reconsider our SDG agenda. Now, we will be hearing that a better world is possible. You heard from Manon Lunas that partnerships were very important. We learned about how important it is to speed up our actions. A lot of this has been guided by the publications of uh, 2019 regarding the 2030 Agenda. It is uh, necessary that we focus uh, on the years beyond 2030 as well. And this is the topic of our next session, which should enable us to understand how and why it is important that we already begin thinking beyond 2030. So without further ado, I would like to invite Fatma Zaha Rostam. Thank you very much, Jean-Luc. I'd like to thank you all. Thank you for organizing this Science Day. This is uh, some work that we carried out at the FAO. We had two uh, pilot projects which was a review of different perspectives. Quickly, of course, uh, we're looking at different scenarios that we're all well aware of, how things might get worse in the future with climate change, problems of diversity, economic problems, and this will lead to deep changes in how we produce food. This is the system that we focused on, the food system. We've already heard people talk about that today. These are, there are different activities in the food production chain, but there are also human systems and natural systems that are affected. So when we're looking at transformation, it has to go through agroecology. This is an integrated approach based on principles of environmental protection that we see here. It is a discipline, but it is also practices, social movements, policies that has been uh, with us uh, throughout the 21st century already. Why do we need to have a foresight? You can see that uh, we need to build the future. We need a kind of manufacture of the future. Foresight and forecasting is a systemic approach in which we can define different possible futures. And this helps us to determine how, what attitude, what position we should have with regard to the future. And so what do we learn from these prospective studies? With Marie and the FAO, we carried out the seven different studies, uh, uh, international, regional, and even on the level of the farm, we carried out studies. We used uh, ver various methods, including a narrative and quantified models as well, and studied the interactions. 
we discussed and compared these different approaches. And then we looked at scientific literature. So we learned some things about the perspectives for agroecology in the future. We have seen that perspective studies enable us to define agroecological futures in a collective manner. We can analyze them and develop participatory approaches. We can have a systemic approach, identifying the factors that must be changed within the system, how people use the soil, uh, how people eat, their, how uh, farming activities are carried out. And so this leads us to discover the diversity of agroecological approaches in the future. There's not one single way, but there are many different aspects that have to be included. And we've seen that there are different ways that people think of it, or there are specific approaches uh, on a given territory or in a national context using different models and based on the local history, in fact. So sometimes important factors are left out, including the, f the food system itself. In order to fully evaluate risks, you have to be sure that you're understanding what are the risks to each part of the overall system. These pers perspectives enable us to consider the feasibility of agroecological futures. We have the business as usual scenario, which is not a good choice. We have alternative scenarios as well that take into account uh, food sovereignty, food security, fairness, uh, territorial fairness. These perspective studies also enable us to debate about the path to take. When we transform food systems, there will be winners and losers. There are choices that have to be made, and this results in some tensions. So we have to be able to discuss and debate in order to see how what's the best way to produce energy to to farm all of this must be debated and this is a learning tool and we've seen that we still don't have enough methods that include this type of debate so so we've seen uh, different uh, narratives, we've seen quantitative results, and these are different proposals that we can make to policy makers, whereas bare, uh, data is often not legible enough. We need models that are adapted to each uh, situation. And it should be something that's inspiring so that people really want to take it on board. We need a communication strategy. So to conclude, we can see there's not a single solution. There's not a one size fits all. Each country has to identify its own policies, its synergies, the drawbacks and advantages, and who would be the main agents of transformation. The scale of this transformation is geographical and it's important to see the connection between the different levels of farm, region, uh, nation, uh, international. When we're looking at meso-local scales, often they're not fully taken into account, whereas they're really key to success. So, of course, takes time, uh, it's necessary to debate and to discuss. Sometimes we've looked at uh, 2050, for example, as a horizon for transformation. It is necessary to take that much time, but uh, it's important that people realize that it is urgent, even if that horizon does seem far away. And you've run out of time, so in fact, it's time to conclude. Yes, so Soon we will be publishing this document, Harnessing Foresight Processes for Food System Transformation Through Art Agroecology. 
travailler avec euh, là. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Et ben, vous Merci beaucoup. Si vous avez des questions. M Merci beaucoup, Fatma. Merci beaucoup, Fatma. Merci beaucoup, Fatma. You're going to tell us about uh, the importance of uh, co-constructing at uh, various levels and to bring together all of these uh, various uh, scales, and that's uh, something that I really um, uh, liked in your presentation. I'm going to give the floor to Guy uh, Richard. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Luc. Uh, I'm going to actually continue in some sense uh, Fatma's presentation and I'm going to give you an example on uh, uh, foresight uh, uh, for agroecology and this was something uh, that we did with the European Union to look at uh, uh, the various uh, scenarios uh, for uh, European agriculture without pesticides by 2050. So. As was said earlier, foresight involves imagining the future of systems uh, in order to inform the current decisions. Uh, I like uh, the expression by Gaston Berger, who said that uh, foresight was about considering the future not as something that is something already that's decided, but rather uh, that step by step uh, uh, is revealed to us, uh, or rather uh, something that is something that we have to make or shape ourselves. Fatma also spoke about uh, food systems in uh, the next slide. Uh, you'll see that I've referred to a very good definition of the HLPE from 2014. So basically, when we talk about uh, food systems, we're talking about all of the activities that uh, cover uh, production all the way through to consumption and take into account all the individuals, institutions, regulations, etc. Now, what can foresight bring uh, to uh, the table in this context? As was mentioned uh, quite a number of times uh, earlier, it's a holistic approach and there are various time frames that you can apply to it. Uh, what is really important is that it's not a non-probabilistic uh, approach. You're really going to look at uh, the disruptions and the weak signals as well. And it's a collective approach that brings together the ac academia, scientists, associations, industrialists, uh, uh, politicians, etc. And this gives it the diversity that we spoke about earlier. And so this also enables us to build different futures. And of course, we can agree to disagree. Uh, because that's what helps us uh, design and develop different kinds of uh, scenarii, and that's what will lead to the development of adequate policies. And then, finally, um, foresight is about thinking on the pathways of transition and transformation. In the next slide, I'm going to talk to you about the approach for a foresight for European agriculture without pesticides. And for this, we came up with, we identified various components. And for each of these components, we identified uh, uh, various general trends and strong signals and weak signals. And so this is what we call horizon scanning. And then in the middle here, you have a morphological table where you bring together all of the hypotheses. And we try and sort of pit these scenarii against each other. And what happens when the foresight exercise is done by an institution such as INRAI, well, we have the power and we have the capacity to bring in modelization, modeling into this exercise. And we can therefore quantify various dimensions. So when this uh, European foresight was undertaken, we also applied all of these different scenarii to 
the different regions, the small regions in various countries. And that's really important because this uh, involved going down to various levels and various scales in order to build these uh, scenarii. So these are the three uh, scenarii that uh, we came up with for uh, agriculture. On the left here, you have a scenario where uh, you have a global uh, food market without any pesticides. And this uh, was possible because of digital technologies that were used in this matter. And then the second scenario is uh, to do with the developing human health by uh, leveraging uh, microbiomes, uh, microbiomes in plant and in soil and in food. And the third scenario is where we mobilize uh, the most complex and diversified landscapes and the regional value chains to come up with a One Health, a European One Health food system. And so we need really strong and coordinated measures uh, to succeed in this decision making and in this consideration of the various scenario. And this uh, involves many, many public policies to do with the use of pesticides, uh, policies to do with agriculture, and all of this also has to go through international trade agreements in order to develop a, a European and global uh, market without pesticides. And then we need to also massively uh, invest in research in order to promote innovation in agriculture. You have one minute to conclude. Well, that's perfect then, says um, uh, Guy Richard. So we see that the magnitude of transformation that is required has pushed us to actually imagine going beyond 2050 even. For climate, we know that up to 2050 is a period that's going to be very, very crucial. And in order to transform food systems, we see that we need to really bring together issues around production, uh, food, uh, trade. We need to share risks and we need to also be able to innovate differently uh, depending on the various contexts because innovation is going to be different in Europe uh, from what it is going to be in Africa or in Asia. And then we also need to uh, further pursue the economic dimension in order to uh, determine the investments that are going to be required in the future. And of course, we're going to also have to bring together the various scales in which all of this is going to happen, i.e. the local, national, continental and global levels. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Guy. And as you were saying in your introduction, well, this uh, presentation was a sort of uh, um, uh, continuity uh, of uh, Fatma's uh, presentation. And uh, you spoke about uh, uh, how it was important to sort of uh, uh, be in disagreement when it come uh, when it came to the point of uh, developing these various scenarii and pit these various uh, diverse scenario against each other. So thank you very much for that. And I'm now going to give the floor to Tebaldo Vinci Guerra, who is going to talk about the new uh, models of uh, progress. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, to everyone. Uh, uh, greetings to all of the organizers, uh, participants, colleagues. Uh, thank you for inviting the Dicastery for Integral Human Development uh, to this web webinar. I'm going to focus on some of the messages that the uh, uh, Pope would like to highlight. Uh, through his encyclical Laudato Si and his recent uh, exhortation Laudate Dium. Incidentally, the use of particularly technical language uh, figures in the latter, and I'm going to use the same too. So, we've seen in the last two centuries a lot of change 
and we need to uh, be very happy with this uh, progress to be uh, also to look at the great possibilities that are open to us with great enthusiasm because science and technology are a marvelous product of human creativity a gift from God the modification of nature has been a feature of humanity since the very beginning and this expresses the tendency of the human spirit to progressively overcome certain conditioning um, think of the developments in agriculture in food preservation among so many other things well however there are two things to bear in mind firstly natural resources that are needed for technology are finite and we can't be sure that tomorrow's scientific research will be able to rectify today's errors. The second major problem, I would say, is that there's a certain kind of obsession uh, with the ever-increasing power of uh, uh, human beings. And in the face of this, non-human reality becomes a mere resource for humankind. And others who do not have as much scientific, technological or economic power, well, they're the ones that are going to suffer. Or suffer. Uh, too bad for them. So if you were to pursue this ideology, Everything that uh, exists ceases to be something that's that needs to be appreciated and protected and valued. And it rather becomes the, a victim of all of uh, human whims and uh, follies. And too bad for neg negative externalities, too bad for injustice and inequality. And technological progress for the recent decades hasn't uh, been accompanied by the development of human responsibility or a certain amount of awareness. There's a lack of ethics to uh, match this progress. So what kind of objectives uh, and values should guide scientific research? Uh, and what is the kind of uh, uh, consideration or value that should govern the planet and the development and the sharing of uh, scientific work and all of its fruits? Well, we need to redefine the kind of progress we want so as to leave a better world behind us with a higher quality of life. When I say integrally, I'm talking about integral human development, i.e. of each facet of each and every individual. Moreover, there is also the concept of integral ecology, as suggested by Laudato Si. And I encourage you to look at this document. Everything is linked, said the Pope. So let's abandon a very utilitarian vision of what surrounds us and recognize that human life is unsustainable without the other creatures because we're all beings in the universe and we're all united by invisible links. So from this point of view, soil desertification can be perceived as a disease for everyone. And we can bemoan the extinction of a species as if it were a mutilation of our own cells. So let's draw up a new development model based on inalienable human dignity with indicators and objectives that reflect meaning, solidarity, justice, responsibility and peace. We need to get back on course 
We need to review our behavior at all levels, at the local level, all the way up to the international level. And for this, the Pope comes up with three pillars, i.e. education, culture and spirituality. The great wisdom from religions. May science cooperate well with each of these three pillars. Thank you to all of your contributions. And my last message is hope and now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these words that uh, shed an important light on our work today. And now, I'd like to talk to you about this question you say we should ask. What is the value of development? And if I think about what the colleagues have said before you, and you yourself talked about the, the need to establish scales, local, global, What do you think would be the priority for you among those scales between the international and the local scale, for example? Because the scientific community is interested in that question. Thank you very much. I think we need to see what multilateralism could achieve if it was really from the grassroots, local elected officials, municipalities, all citizens, if all citizens were not only heard, but also engaged and involved in these processes, and this is an appeal for substantial democracy, if people really had power, I think perhaps this is a bit of a utopic, but I think that's how we can really bring about change. Yes, this corresponds to what some of your colleagues have said before, and now, now we'll hear from Lorenzo Bellou. Thank you, Jean-Luc. Thank you, Raoul, for your invitation, and hello to everyone, to our ambassador who made the introduction to this very important International Science Day, very inspiring. It's difficult to add much to everything that I've already heard from colleagues, but perhaps I could just bring a few ideas forward after hearing from Fatma, Guy, and Tebaldo. Fatma said that foresight studies show that there is no sustainability for traditional agriculture. But at the same time, to change the reality, we have to manage conflicts between winners and losers. And Guy said, that's important that we have strong coordinated measures to achieve this transformation. This means, means we have to go on our obsession with economic growth beyond the, what our environment can support. I think about these three presentations. And I think about what can set off transformation and drive it. And when we are looking towards uh, far horizons, as uh, Guy said, we mustn't just focus on the near future, but really look far into the future. We're looking at four alternative scenarios here for the future of agri-food systems. 
And in the long term, all of this is linked to what's happening in the socioeconomic system and the governmental systems around the world. Here you see that we have worked on four scenarios. First of all, nothing changes. We continue more or less as we have in the past. And this means that uh, we react to problems on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, and we don't have a long-term vision. And of course, this will not lead to a satisfactory agri-food systems in the future. Then we have the future adjusted. What does that mean? That means that measures have been taken for some short-term results in particular, and in particular to achieve some of the objectives of the 2030 agenda. Suppose we tried to get 15% of our targets. Under pressure, we try to solve problems here and there, but this doesn't give us a systemic long-term view. The third scenario is the race to the abyss, the collapse scenario, uh, the system uh, that would result in the collapse, collapse of entire sections of socioeconomic, environmental, and agri-food systems with irreversible consequences. And finally, the fourth category we call sacrifices or choices for sustainability. Transformations come with a cost. There is always a price. You don't have to be an economist to understand that in order to uh, reach change, you have to invest. And to invest, you have to have saved. For example, you want to buy a house. That means, first of all, you have to save some money, put some aside, and then make your large purchase. And it's the same idea when we're looking at the transforming our agri-food systems. You have to make investments. And who's going to pay for these investments? It's a problem of institutions. Society has to have rules. There must be rules that manage relations between countries. And here you see the possible pathways and the role of strategic choices with regard to sustainability. There are some scenarios that don't have immediate benefits, but that might have benefits with regard to improvements over the long term. The FAO is looking at improved production, improved life, improved agriculture, and improved environment. Those are our four areas for improvement that we focus on at the FAO. And some of these objectives may be in conflict with regard to short-term and long-term results. Sometimes we forget that there's a price to be paid for a non-sustainability, and so we need to invest in now in sustainability. You have one minute left. And here you can see that the FAO has identified four priority areas for investment, things that can trigger transformation, institutions and governments, as Guy already said, these are very important. Consumer or citizen awareness, we've mentioned that today. Distribution of income and wealth, so that people that will have to pay the price of transformation will get some benefits from it. And finally, innovative technologies and approaches. Depending on how 
we activate the different pillars of transformation, we will see that the impact of the different scenarios will vary. We need to build the future, not just sit around and wait for it. So, as Antonio Gramsci said, I am pessimistic by intelligence, but optimistic by will. It would seem that the situation would lead us to be pessimistic. But at the same time, we cannot allow ourselves to be pessimistic. People who don't have access to enough or to healthy food, we can't accept that. Millions of people suffering from hunger, from hunger, a billion people who live in extreme poverty, that's not acceptable. So Gramsci was a famous Italian, much more famous than I am. And he said, whatever the situation, I imagine the worst that could happen in order to mobilize all of my reserves and my will and thus to overcome each obstacle that presents itself. And this is part of the FAO's driving force as well, overcoming obstacles and embracing optimism. Thank you, Lorenzo. We had planned to hear from some young people, as we did last year. And this year, it's Giulia Tariello who is a European delegate who, with other delegates from many countries around the world, has been attending the conference today. Or the... And so, as you were saying, you know, it's, it's possible to be pessimistic, but when I see our young people, then I'm filled with optimism. Julia, are you with us? Hello, everyone. Julia Tariello. I'm from the EU Youth Delegation to the UN. Your presentations were all very interesting. I think, in general, it's important to bring science closer to young people. You represent a generation that's different from mine. How do you think it would be possible to take account of the opinion of youth so that you could encourage them to continue to study the sciences with the purposes of advancing the cause of sustainable development? Thank you, Julia. Is there anyone in the panel who would like to answer that question? Someone from the last session? I think that, yes, we have to keep uh, young people's opinions in mind, and I would encourage young people to express themselves. But we also have to consider what people were saying uh, from the previous sector, from the 19th century, from the 1970s and 1980s. people who were talking about limits to growth already. I think over the course of history, we have faced collective crises before, and it's important to try to understand why all, despite all of our historical experience, we still have a hard time coming together to work towards something like sustainable development. And I think that young people will really be a key to genuine transformation. 
Guy, would you like to say something? Yes, thank you, Julia, because I understand that when we're doing these uh, foresight studies, we bring together different points of view. We try to bring together people from different parts of society, but it's true that we don't always really take account of young people's point of view. I never really thought about the need for paying special attention to that. I think that you've really given me something to think about. And in the, my future work, I will try to keep that in mind. So thank you very much. That's not something, that's not an idea that I come up against regularly. So it's true that International Science Day is an important moment for all of us to think about how we work and how we might work differently. We have one or two minutes maximum. And Elizabeth will be joining us. So you've got another minute and a half. Thank you, Clara. Here's a question. What about land sharing and land sparing? Is this uh, something that we need to keep in mind? Is this something that we should think about? Land sharing, land sparing, is this something that we might want to include in our foresight analyses? Fatma, perhaps you could answer? Well, this is something that we do take into account in some studies. We've looked at land use and how land use should be taken into account. Different models, often these are biophysical models that look at available land, how land use is distributed. Uh, but the question isn't limited to that. There are qualitative approaches that are important as well to understand how we might describe what uses we could have and at what scales when we do this these foresight studies. I think land sparing and land land use is something that we have to look at on a local level and then land sharing, land sparing, this is indeed something that is just coming to the fore. Other reactions? Well, I think Jean-Luc, uh, we're going to give the floor to our uh, uh, two uh, chairs. I'd simply like to thank all of the uh, presenters. I don't think there was any question that was pre-prepared. Uh, and uh, I think this is uh, the same, this holds true also for the chairs. And so they're simply going to react to what they've listened to this past hour and a half, two hours. And there are quite a few questions, in fact, that we haven't um, uh, responded to, and uh, as I said in the beginning, um, well, we'll think about some of these questions because they deserve to be thought about, and we're going to send you answers uh, uh, by written form between now and January. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you for the questions because very often the questions are more important than the answers themselves. Elizabeth, are you here? Uh, chair and director of um, CIRAD, and Philippe Mogan, who's uh, CEO of INDRAI. Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Well, then, perfect. Thank you to everyone. To th thank you to uh, the entire audience uh, that uh, we're lucky to have amongst us. I'd like to thank uh, uh, the ambassador 
uh, thank you to Raoul and thank you to all your team uh, that uh, have worked so hard to organize this uh, event today. I know that it's a colossal amount of work uh, and uh, so thank you for that. Thank you to all of the colleagues from uh, FAO and from all of the other institutions who have helped us uh, uh, in setting up this platform of uh, sharing and exchange. Uh, I'm not going to try and uh, summarize uh, the meeting and the discussions because it was a very rich uh, discussion uh, and I should, uh, I do admit that I, I wasn't here for some of the exchanges, uh, but I simply want to say that all of the exchanges were so dense if all of the actors come together and uh, to look at all of the institutions and of the organizations that you represent come together, more than 500 coming from all continents, come together and who are represented here in some way or the other in this debate. And I think that's very, very impressive. That uh, speaks to the success of this event. And I also think that's a sign of the importance of the subjects that we've dealt with, not just the three themes that we outlined for these sessions, but also the 2030 agenda, uh, which uh, concerns all of us and that all of us would like to contribute towards. And so this 2030 agenda is something that's a topical subject uh, and national pathways of food systems uh, is also something that's uh, particularly worrying uh, to all of us. And thank you to Sylvia Ikra for doing all of the work that she's done on the subject. And speaking particularly specifically about Sira, I'd like to go over three points mainly. Firstly, and this is of course something that I'm saying for Sira, and I'm sure that Valérie and uh, Philippe from uh, the other organizations uh, also um, share this preoccupation. Uh, it's true that we're looking at global problems, but we're also looking at uh, community level and local level preoccupations, because we do believe that that's where we can find the solutions. And we want to institutionalize and commercialize solutions that are useful and that can highlight public debate. And we do this uh, through partnerships uh, with other institutions, through platforms. Uh, and we're also doing this uh, by breaking free of our silos, disciplinary silos. And one example of this approach is something that was concretized with the FAO. And that's to do with all of the work that we've done on food system assessment. And a few of these assessments were undertaken for FAO. And that was a real challenge because this enabled us to uh, draw links between global uh, stakes and issues and local uh, solutions and all of the disciplines that uh, come in to this uh, equation. And the second point I'd like to make is that, of course, we're talking about developing public policy, which uh, will accelerate the movement towards uh, SDGs. And there, too, I think there's a need to uh, make advances when it comes to the interfaces between science and decision making, both at local and, sorry, national and international levels. And I think the FAO can come in and play a major role in this matter. Uh, well, we're actually neighbors of uh, CGIR and we're also uh, part of uh, the a panel that involves uh, the IPCC, IPBES, uh, and so many other organizations. And so the science that emanates from all of these uh, organizations on SDGs comes together to identify um, priorities, uh, arbitrations, etc. And that's uh, But that doesn't mean to say that we do not need simple documents that can help uh, policymakers make uh, better decisions. And that, I think, is a major point I wanted to make. And then finally, the 2030 agenda also needs to be further looked into. So I encourage you to uh, look at the GSDR 2023 report and to think about it and to establish 
dialogues on the fact that, on the basis that there is an urgency to act, and that's something that so many reports and so many assemblies have uh, spoken about. And we have to look at the short term necessities, of course, but we also have to consider the long term views. I think we have an opportunity here to think together on the long-term vision for research. And this doesn't mean there's a lack of activity, uh, but this long-term vision will be useful to leverage what is necessary to take action in the short term. So I would like to conclude by once again saying thank you and uh, say that I hope that I will be able to meet all of you again next year uh, and look at other interesting topics such as water. And thanks once again to the entire team that worked uh, to organizing towards organizing this very beautiful event. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, now I hand over the floor to Philippe Mogin, uh, who is also going to speak and uh, present his concluding remarks uh, of his, this uh, webinar. And then the webinar, uh, webinar will come to an end uh, uh, with music and with the drawings. Philip, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Raoul. It's an honor and uh, a delight to conclude, to present my concluding remarks. Uh, thank you uh, on my behalf and on uh, my team's behalf uh, to the ambassador for all of this work. Uh, thank you to all of the speakers, the teams from uh, IBES, uh, IRD, INRAE, CIRAL, uh, all of the presenters uh, who took the time off uh, uh, to uh, speak on such important subjects. As a conclusion, I would simply like to say that while listening to all of the presentations, I did get a feeling that it was extremely rich uh, and uh, I would particularly like to mention the very strong words of uh, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Ate, who showed us exactly where we stood when it came comes to uh, the uh, 2030 agenda and the 2017 SDGs, especially in major uh, themes uh, such as gender equality, poverty, etc., where we're uh, uh, actually going backwards rather than moving uh, forwards. Uh, Obviously, this stock take should um, catch our attention as citizens. However, we do believe that the 17 SDGs uh, must remain as beacons uh, for action and give us clear guidelines as to the challenges that we need to rise up to to reach a satisfying level of on all of these SDGs is uh, still possible. And there are synergies uh, between these SDGs, but all of this is very complicated. And so therefore, how to make progress on this? Let's uh, remain optimistic. Uh, we can, as we saw, uh, make uh, uh, progresses on scenario of transition as we're presented by uh, two or three colleagues uh, earlier this afternoon. And this involves taking into account climate change, biodiversity, so soil, um, water management, uh, employment, etc. All of this has to be thought about in a systemic way uh, rather than in silos. Uh, and Sylvia Ekra also spoke about um, some encouraging elements when it came to uh, food system transformation. And uh, these are items that will enable us to better work in partnership with uh, various stakeholders at various levels. And the summit on this uh, matter actually enables us to imagine uh, the various uh, scenarii that are possible. Then my colleague uh, 
Olivier spoke about the various scenarii of transition. This uh, gives us a framework. Uh, to look at socio-economic uh, transitions, which needs to be co-constructed with uh, all stakeholders, farmers, distributors, consumers, uh, local communities, uh, and of course, uh, generally speaking, all citizens. And that's part of the complexity of uh, the ecological transition. The number of stakeholders involved simply mean that sometimes we're just in a bottleneck and sometimes at an, uh, a, a cul-de-sac. And we need to make this complexity and reflect all of this in our research and in innovation. However, we do have at our disposal tools to rise up to this challenge a huge amount of data, a huge amount of ex ex international expertise. And so people are expecting of us to leverage all of this in order to come up with solutions. And obviously, we're not going to decide instead of uh, those that must take these decisions, but we're here to help them to co-construct and to develop uh, these uh, itineraries for the future. And we spoke about uh, all of these uh, elements, and uh, we see now that there is uh, there is a reason to remain optimistic. Environmental planning that was uh, undertaken by the uh, French government is an attempt to bring together uh, various uh, elements on uh, climate change, but on uh, biodiversity, bring together economic actors and various other actors of the society. And uh, in France, we're actually uh, going to look at how this is going to be uh, translated at the community level. At the European level, there are lots of other things underway. And the Commission, the European Commission, uh, has uh, uh, decided to support a very huge uh, program, partnership program on food systems, and that resonates very well with the conclusions of the UN Summit on Food Systems. And uh, INRA is going to coordinate uh, uh, this uh, part of this project with uh, many stakeholders involved in the uh, food system uh, value chain. And we're going to work uh, on agroecology and also with the uh, European institutions on this front. Uh, other examples that show that the scientific community is ready to work on these very daunting tasks. Um, there's the four per thousand project uh, that Paul Lu presented. And there's also um, the presentation by uh, Manu uh, Lunas, uh, the initiative PRISA that uh, has developed uh, um, uh, to such a great length in just uh, three years. Uh, and so these are just small drops of water that work towards the transition, but there are all of these initiatives that show that we are heading in the right direction. The uh, major global coalition at the, that came out at the end of uh, the UN summit um, uh, and there's the other coalition on uh, school meals. Well, these are also objectives, uh, projects that show that the reflection is done at the global level, but the action is actually undertaken at the local level. And this is what we wish to shape for the future and for the achievement of the 2030 agenda. Well, we didn't have time to go over all of the topics. Uh, uh, the time was very well managed by Raoul, and uh, I think uh, now this session has given us uh, more um, appetite to uh, dig further. Uh, and uh, later this year, there will be other reports published by the UN, and I hope we'll have the occasion to meet again to discuss again together these reports. Uh, Elizabeth. Uh, said uh, earlier that uh, next year, around uh, the 22nd of November, well, save the dates right away, we're going to organize another International Science Day on uh, the theme of water. Uh, 
which is obviously a huge issue for the future of our planet. So it is now time to conclude. And when I heard uh, Lorenzo uh, Bellou, um, I wanted to uh, quote an expression that I also like uh, uh, very much to summarize our discussions uh, in the face of obstacles, uh, emergencies and tragedies. There is progress that might be slow, but there is a huge mobilization and uh, we need to fight with all of this mobilization against this cynic, cynical uh, aspect that might cower us. And uh, you can continue to count on us for supporting you. So let's listen to the music and have a lovely uh, day, afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Thank you for your participation. Thank you to everyone. Uh, the music will begin in a few seconds and those who can remain with us, you can continue to send us your questions in the chat. Uh, the International Science Day has uh, thus ended and uh, thank you very much and see you next year. Let the music begin. A color is all the rainbow, so pretty in the sky. I also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands. I say, How do you do? I they really sing, I love you. I see babies crying. I wish them would. They learn much more. They I will never, never, never learn anything to myself. What a wonderful world.
and thoughtless thing That's the way it was Happened so naturally I did not know it was love And I think I find forced to hold me close I don't know what I'm gonna do I let myself go And I will fly through the stars I hope and I will last forever Come on, sing together Oh, 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 oh Makes me happy, makes me feel this way. Ain't nobody knows me better than you. I've been waiting for you, it's been so long. I know just what I go do when I hurt your soul. With my heart, I feel this, give me feedback. You are good at praises, give me some. And I will fly through the stars. I hope it now will last forever. Come on, take me oh, 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 oh. Ain't nobody like loves me better. Makes me happy. Makes me feel this way. Ain't nobody like loves me better. Timothy on keys, Melker on the guitar, and James on drums, and Tatiana. Thank you very, very much. See you soon.